Coming up on show 420, we weed out details of the BMW iNext. Germany's EV market is smoking and we get high altitude testing. All of those stories on show 420. Not too much Elon Musk news today. He's been a good boy lately. Sort of. Anyway, uh, let's get on with the news today. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're listening in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily, Tuesday edition, 19th of March. My name is Martin Lee. Hello to any new listeners of the podcast. There must be someone in the world listening to this for the very first time. Here's how it works. I go through all of the EV stories that I can find, hundreds of stories a day, and I try and wheedle it down to just a few that I think you need to know about to save you time, basically. If you didn't hear yesterday's show, I had a bit of a charging nightmare in London where some chargers wouldn't work with my car, some weren't working on a uh, contact list because I wasn't a member or didn't have the RFID card, I wasn't joined up with their scheme. Went onto one of the apps and it said the nearest charger to me was boxed in. Anyway, so I, t- I talked about this story yesterday and I had three emails uh, this morning to uh, to go through, which just goes to show incredible customer service. First of all, I mentioned that I pulled into a Polar Plus Ultra Charger uh, here in the UK, owned by BP Charge Master, and I'm a member of their network. It's a small fee you pay every month, less than ten pounds, and then you get discounted charging. And uh, I, the key fob just lives in the car. I pulled up to one of them. And it was all marked for London taxis only. And the road marking said only taxis, but it was on, it was on the app. And so uh, so I used it. Anyway, they, uh, they got hold of me today to firstly apologise for the confusion when that charger went in. So that charger is for taxis, by the way. London has more electric taxis every day. And that is specifically to charge London's electric taxis. When they first put it live, it went publicly on one of the third-party apps we have in the UK. It's called Zap Map. It's not live on the official Polar app. I wasn't using that one. I've, I use a, a different one. It's called Zap Map, and it went live on that. And it was it shouldn't have done. It's, uh, it's since been rectified, but for some reason, my app wasn't updating. So it was showing up on my app to say that I could charge there. Then when I got there, it was taxi only. In theory, I should never have known about that charger because it should be hidden from my view. Anyway, so that explains that one. Uh, that's being sorted out. Shell emailed me this morning to say one of the guys at Shell, he listens to this podcast, was disappointed that I talked about it, asked me to uh, say, again, I'd looked on the app to find my nearest Shell recharge stations. I haven't used one yet. I'm really looking forward to trying one out. Again, contact list, and it was 10 minutes from where I was. I was re- running really short of power last night, and the app review one week ago said it's all boxed in. I told Shell which one it was, and they replied instantly and said, right, so the way petrol stations work, they own some of them, but some petrol stations are franchises. So other people own the business, but they are branded with the oil company, the petrol company. And the one I was particularly looking at is one of those ones, and it actually wasn't a Shell recharge. If if I'd have actually bothered to look at the Zap map on my app, uh, if I'd looked at the fine print, it's a charger called Genie Point not one of the Shell ones. So they were sort of pleased that there actually isn't a problem to look into. And then finally, uh, ESB is a network here in London. And I went to two of their chargers last night, really at the end of my tether. And I'm not a member of their network, their club. I haven't got one of their tags, but I know they do contact lists. And two of their chargers that I went to were both out of order for contact lists and only working for members if they had a, a... a a tag. Uh, I couldn't just use my bank card, my credit card, untap it and pay. They did say this morning, actually, uh, sorry about that. It's being looked into why the contact list is had a big red cross next to it on the screen. In the meantime, they have an app and I could have done it that way, which again, wasn't signposted on the, on the charger. So I wanted to bring you those stories, not because you care about my charging dilemmas, just because of three great examples of customer service, and I thought that was wonderful. So thank you very much, as always, to myev.com for helping make this show. That is the world's first marketplace, all about buying and selling and learning about EVs. I know that we're five minutes into the podcast and we haven't got to the news, so here we go. Uh, oh, no, first of all, three new Patreon supporters. Thank you very much. A new producer, Ian Griffiths. Ian, you star. Sorry, I didn't mention you yesterday. Hello to two new executive producers. The first one is Nathan. Now, Nathan Gore-Brown. And secondly, uh, today, Ralph Jensen or Jensen. Ralph, executive producers, along with Nathan. Thank you very much. Right, here's the news. Uh, 
some big news today about the new Canadian budget. A part of, as part of its new budget, the Canadian federal government has announced a new $5,000 incentive for EVs, but only ones that cost less than $45,000 Canadian dollars, which means it does exclude Tesla vehicles, says Fred for Electric today. Some Canadian provinces already have EV incentive programs, but unlike in the US, there's never been a federal program to reduce the cost of electric vehicles. With the launch of their new budget, the Canadian government has announced a $5,000 incentive program, not yet completed or active, but the $45,000 cutoff does mean that cars like the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Bolt, the Hyundai Ioniq all make it. Teslas don't know the base price of their Model 3 starts at 40 seven thousand canadian dollars and the government have put the threshold at a convenient 45 anyway the budget says this and i quote to encourage more canadians to buy zero emission vehicles budget 2019 proposes to provide 300 million dollars over three years starting in 2019 to 20 to transport canada uh, the transport canada is introducing a new federal purchase incentive of five thousand dollars for evs and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, I won't find many of those around, uh, with a manufacturer's suggested retail price of $45,000. Manufacturer's suggested retail price of $45,000 is the key phrase there. I'll put a link to Electrek in the show notes. Let's move on to BMW. Motor1.com are delighted to get some new video and a really long spy video. And if you think that this is kind of long distance spy shots of someone hiding in the forest, uh, you'd be wrong. They got very close. And it is kind of funny. Our spies were once again in the right place at the right time. They filmed the production version of the new BMW iNex, the electric SUV, which is testing under very, very heavy winter conditions in Sweden. It's over five minutes long. The link is on motor1.com. And what makes me laugh is they put the fake exhaust pipes on them and there's two of them there's a, a black and white one and a blue and white one and when the blue and white one goes past you can hear the fake electric noise that sounds a little bit like a ufo going past i mean they're so obviously electric cars but they still put those two big fake exhausts on who you fooling bmw the i next which might actually be called the i5 is going to be the electric equivalent of a bmw x5 if you think about the dimensions the size and shape and the styling I'm a real fan, by the way, of this. It's a car, the X5 is a car that everybody knows. If you're in the market for that kind of car on your shopping list, uh, for a German SUV of that size and shape and price point, then the X5 is easily in your top three. Easily, but it'll be, it'll be on your list somewhere to consider. So that means an electric version of it is incredibly good news. It'll be their most technologically advanced vehicle, it hits the market in 2021. It's currently in advanced stages of cold weather testing, and that's a really good sign for when we'll get it. We know the iX3 is coming. Talk about popular models. The X3 is a linchpin of the BMW product lineup. So the iX3 is going to be huge, and the i4 are coming this year and next, respectively. I'll put a link to Motor1 in the, in the show notes. Well, sales reports for the first two months of this year show that the biggest market in Germany, in Europe rather, is Germany, not Norway, which many people think. Mark Kainer, InsideEVs.com, says it had to happen at some point. Norway is such a smaller market. So when you look at the raw numbers, uh, Germany, with a huge population, have now taken the lead. Norway uh, has doubled its battery electric vehicle sales, and Germany has increased... Uh, 50 times from less than 2% share, and they've gone up huge amounts. Uh, according to data compiled by the industry analyst Matthias Schmidt, who is schmidtmatthias.de, uh, the top five, that's his website, by the way, he's a, an analyst here in Europe, and he seems to find out stuff before just about everybody else, well worth following on Twitter as well. The top five countries in Europe for electric car sales in the first two months of the year, Germany at the top, then Norway, France, Netherlands, and UK. And if you think that Norway not being the number one is going to be, uh, uh, you know, kind of a problem or people thinking, oh, Norway was the, you know, the poster child of, of EVs. Well, yeah, it still is. Obviously, it, in terms of the percentage sales, Norway is still so far ahead. And actually, Norway is that figurehead with great incentives, great added little bonuses like free use of bus lanes and incentives. Norway can still very much lead the way, even if Germany is now number one in pure raw numbers. 
Let's go to Germany then. Let's talk uh, Volkswagen. They've threatened to quit. This is really interesting. VW have threatened. They haven't quit. They've threatened to quit. Germany's very, very influential car-making lobby group. Now, the lobby group's called the VDA, and there's a dispute over Germany's national car industry and how it approaches the transition in the transport sector to low-carbon technologies. The newspaper, which is called Weltam Sonntag, reported today. According to this article, Volkswagen really wants the industry lobby group to budge from its rigid insistence on technological openness. In other words, open to any and all technologies of the future in the transition to the future, VW want them to focus more on EVs, as they're the cars that are on the road right now. They're not. We're not talking about some mystical future technology that in 10 years' time, when we sol solve these problems, will favour X technology over Y technology. EVs are on the market now. Great EVs are doing hundreds of thousands of miles now. This isn't future. This is now technology. In many cases, it's yesterday's technology uh, because they've been around for so long. So, VW doing you could say the right thing here and putting pressure on their national car lobby to go. No, no, no! Don't kick this into the long grass and say, "Oh, we're open to whatever, whether it's hydrogen or fuel cells or something else not yet invented." We're going to be open to everything. Just get behind EVs and get behind them. According to Energy, sorry, CleanEnergyWire.org, Volkswagen last week announced it would accelerate its ambitious EV plan following Dieselgate. They're on a big mission to reinvent that company brand. Uh, which is still, they would admit, they, everyone admits, it's still tainted after Dieselgate. They've got a long, long way to go over many, many years to win back customers. Some who say, I will never buy another VW again. And some who are waiting to be won back. 20 million electric cars in the next decade, fully CO2 neutral as a company by 2050. I'll put a link to that article in the show notes. In the US, Daimler has delivered the first Fuso e Canters. They are electric trucks. They've been delivered to Penske Truck Leasing, and they're going to be doing urban deliveries in California, says Mark Kane for the excellent InsideEVs.com today. In December, at the end of last year, Penske also had the first of its 10 freight liners. They're called EM2s. They're going to be tested and they're waiting for some heavy duty trucks as well the e cascadias all the vehicles are being evaluated in real world conditions to work out which ones are best suited for different use cases as the trucking world electrifies moving to china the chinese property firm evergrande group is moving from property into EVs. They say they will make their first EVs in June this year as part of their goal to become the world's largest new energy vehicle company. That would be impressive. They want to do it within the next three to five years, according to their chairman. And in a Reuters report today, uh, Huai Ka Yan, I hope I've said his name correctly, uh, said these comments at a conference in the eastern city of Tianjin last weekend, according to a statement on their website, the company website. He also said that Evergrande is going to start selling its first EVs globally soon. Didn't say what countries and didn't say when, but soon. They will use the electric car production technology from Swedish car makers Saab and Koenigsegg, the drive systems from Netherlands e-traction, according to this statement, and they will sell their cars globally soon. Let's move on to the Audi Q2. New spy shots. Again, we've had some great spy shots today. It's been a really positive day of EV news. Days like today give me a massive energy boost, by the way. It's been an amazing day for EV news. New spy shots have surfaced. The very first look at the Audi Q2 e-tron. Fully electric version of the Audi compact crossover. It's got some extra concealment. The images still provide a really good look at the upcoming EV. It says Chris Bruce. Now, Chris is writing for InsideEVs.com today. Powertrain specs for it are still a mystery. Some speculation that if Audi want to get there, you know, there or thereabouts in that segment in a couple of years with a car like the Q2, then they're going to have to go 300 miles they're going to have to do some pretty fast charging. Some people say they're only going to sell the Q2 in China, and the company might make a long wheelbase L model exclusively for that market. It's a great size car. If you've been excited about the Tesla Model Y, you'll be excited about the Audi Q2 e-tron, that size kind of size car. And finishing off, something that I was having a debate with someone 
a respectful debate on on my YouTube comments. And I always try, by the way, if you leave a, a YouTube comment, I will have seen it, I promise. And I try to reply to everybody, either on Facebook, YouTube, my emails. It just takes me like half a day sometimes because I'm a, a little bit snowed at times. However, however, I was having a debate with someone and they were saying, uh, you know, it, it was the internet. So he, he didn't go in with both feet, but he, he was uh, robust with me to say that I'm wrong to suggest that plug-in hybrid owners shouldn't use rapid chargers. And of course, as you may know, plug-in hybrids often charge at 3, 3.6 kilowatts. Rapid chargers are expensive. They're few and far between. They charge at 50 or 100 kilowatts. And someone who doesn't have their own charging cable, but they've got their plug-in hybrid car with a big fossil engine in the front and their tiny little slow charging battery, I did suggest that there needs to be better education so that if they're charging and someone turns up in their full EV, desperate for a charge, they can charge quickly for 20 minutes. Well, then they should understand that different cars, you know, their car is a very, very slow charging car. And, and, and you know, and I, I, I accept that, uh, that I, when I say that, you are then welcome to criticize me. Uh, I'm not having a go at plug-in hybrid owners, but I know that that is not an opinion shared by everybody. However, there's a new article today which does back up the central point in all of this, which is education. Conflicting and confusing information on the latest generation of EVs has created what is being called a knowledge gap for potential buyers. And that, they say, is holding people back from buying an EV. A new white paper from a magazine called What Car came out today. Uh, despite 2019 being set to become a huge year for EVs, 2020 is going to be off the, sh off the charts next year. Uh, a new What Car survey says that they asked 9,000 motorists, 8.4 of them, are already considering a fully electric vehicle as their next vehicle. Uh, and in a new comparison tool they did as well, they looked at people's journeys and they found that easily one in 10 drivers would save money instantly today with an EV. In comparison, market share in the UK for full EVs is much lower than the potential. Um, I would... I would take so I would question that study by the way and all I'm all I'm reading out is their press release uh, which says on their comparison tool EVs are an optimal choice for one in 10 drivers uh, I just need to dig into what that means because if it is about saving money EVs will save a hundred percent of drivers money there is there is that debate has been put to bed so many years ago. Total cost of ownership, servicing, maintenance, fewer moving parts, even the fuel that you put in EVs is so much cheaper than fossil fuels in pretty much most markets that have a reasonably high taxation on fuel and oil derived products that you use for mobility. Certainly here in the UK and in most places that you'll be listening to this podcast, you probably have a pretty high tax on fuel that's, that's being used uh, for revenue generation by the government. So, there, like, there is no doubt, 10 out of 10 drivers, in my mind, maybe I'm biased, could save money with an EV. So I, I just need to dig into what that means, one in 10. Anyway, uh, so I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you want to read out more. Uh, let's go on to our question of the week this week. Thank you to myev.com for setting our question of the week. Keep your comments coming in. Uh, how would you like to be billed for rapid charging when you're out and about? What's your preference? Pay as you go. Is it to be part of a some sort of club? Is it just to plug in? and be billed at the end of the month? Is it, I mean, I personally like the experience with Polar Plus because uh, I have a running bill. Uh, the one thing I would like, actually, in the app, in the in the the iOS app, I can see all of the list of recharges that I've done, but I can't see the price that each one cost me. So I would love to be able to look at a running total of what have I spent so far this month. Uh, you know, I guess I could do the sums. It's ten pence ish per kilowatt hour, but no one's going to do that. So I'd, I'd like to I'd like to be able to see in one place what's my running total this month. You know, like your mobile bill would be. You know, when you log into your your, your mobile phone app, and it will tell you how much you spent. So I'd, you know, I'd like that, but otherwise I like opening the app and seeing my charges. So I like that model. I don't mind a key fob. I don't mind an RFID card. I know it's a pretty unpopular opinion. I like doing it that way. Once a month, it comes out of my bank account. And then I, I don't want I don't want to do contactless where I've got like 50 different transactions on my bank statement. That would stress me out. I know some people would swear by doing it that way. So let me know your thoughts. Email me hello at evnewsdaily.com. Leave the comments, all the usual places. 
There are 208 patrons of the show that keep us going. Thank you for your support. There are 419 previous shows to download for free. Get the new ones by hitting the subscribe button. And thank you for all the reviews that have been coming in lately. Do yours, because it makes such a big difference to get a review. One star, five stars, say whatever you want. Makes a huge difference to how the show is rated. In the meantime, come and catch up in any of my social places by searching EV News Daily. I'll come top, should do, come top of the search. In the meantime, have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.